For those of you who are new to my channel, I like to make stinky things. <sighs> Very stinky things. Like thioacetone, which is supposed to be the worst smelling chemical on earth, and selenols, which are actually way worse and scare even the more experienced chemists. And soon, I'll be showing off a new class of chemicals called isocyanides, which from my experience totally eclipse everything that I've previously tested. Holy crap! To get to this point though, I had to synthesize a few different precursors, and the one I'll be making today is known as terpbutylamine. By itself, this compound is actually very useful as a catalyst and reagent, and plus, it has a strong, unpleasant smell, so me making it was basically inevitable. To make terpbutylamine, the following reagents are necessary. 98% sulfuric acid, urea, terpbutyl alcohol, sodium hydroxide, and ethylene glycol. Almost all these can be bought on Amazon, but I had to concentrate the sulfuric acid myself by boiling drain opener. To start, a 400 milliliter beaker was placed into an ice bath and filled with 52 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. Once the acid cooled down to about 15 degrees Celsius, 30 grams of urea was added at a rate slow enough to keep the temperature below 25 C. It's best for the urea to be a fine powder when you do this, since the large crystals that come straight out of the bag take forever to dissolve. After all the urea was in solution, I let the temperature settle to below 10 degrees before slowly dripping in 94 milliliters of terbutanol. In this part of the reaction, a compound known as terbutyl urea is formed, which is what will be converted into terbutyl amine later on. For this step, keeping the temperature below 25 degrees is fairly critical, because higher temperatures lead to the formation of diisobutylene, which presents itself as an insoluble oil on the surface of the mixture. Its presence doesn't necessarily hurt the reaction, but it does mean your yield will be lower. With all the terpbutanol mixed in, I was left with a thick, syrupy solution, which was allowed to sit overnight to ensure a complete reaction. Once 16 hours had elapsed, the entire reaction mixture was dumped into 750 milliliters of ice water, which caused most of the terpbutyl urea to crash out. Then, I dissolved 80 grams of sodium hydroxide into 350 milliliters of water, and added the resulting solution to the icy mixture. This served to neutralize the remaining sulfuric acid and crash out more terpbutyl urea, which I vacuum filtered off and transferred into a separate beaker. Now, at this point, we could probably just move on to making the terpbutylamine, but I wanted brownie points for being a responsible chemist, so I decided to sacrifice my yield to the void known as recrystallization. For this, I added 250 milliliters of boiling hot water to my product, and let strong heat until no more would dissolve. The major side product in this reaction is diterpbutyl urea, which is less soluble than the desired monoterpbutyl urea, meaning we can get rid of most of it through hot filtration, which is exactly what I did. The solution that made it through the filtration was poured into a separate beaker, well, two beakers, and chilled on ice to precipitate out the terpbutyl urea. After about 30 minutes, everything seemed to have crystallized, so I vacuum filtered off the solids and dried everything thoroughly on the pump. In total, I managed to produce a modest 14 grams of dry terpbutyl urea, which corresponds to a yield of about 26%. This was slightly lower than the expected 31-33% to conversion mentioned in the paper, so no brownie points for yield but it was still enough to move on to the terpbutylamine synthesis. For this, 15 milliliters of water was added to a 250 milliliter boiling flask, followed by 12 grams of sodium hydroxide. Once that dissolved, I added a whopping 45 milliliters of ethylene glycol to the solution, and finally poured in the 14 grams of terpbutyl urea. Not all of it dissolved, but that's okay. This reaction destroys everything regardless of its cooperation. With everything added, a reflux condenser was connected to the top of the flask, and the hot plate was turned on. The paper I was following said to maintain a gentle reflux for about 4 hours. So I pulled out my blowtorch because I have the patience of a hyperactive child and did my best to avoid boiling over my flask contents. Around this time, the strong odor of terpbutylamine became more and more pronounced. Like most alkyl amines, this stuff has an intense ammonia-like odor. Some people say the smell is fish-like, but I personally found it to be more akin to fresh animal urine. Certainly unpleasant, but I have smelled worse. Anyways, after about 2 hours, the reaction seemed mostly complete so I reconfigured the setup for a distillation. Terpbutylamine boils at roughly 45 degrees Celsius, so most of it came over in the initial fraction. I kept collecting the distillate until the temperature reached about 70 degrees, at which point the heat was turned off and the product was isolated. In the end, I came out with just over 5 milliliters of crude terpbutylamine. The major contaminant here is water, which won't really affect anything, so I'm okay with it. If I had more product, I would try to redistill it to get the 40 to 50 degree fraction by itself but with such a small amount, I felt better just keeping it as is. Assuming most of the sample was terpbutylamine, my yield with respect to terpbutyl urea was no more than 40%, where it should have been closer to 
Honestly, if I had carried out the reflux for the full four hours with a more efficient condenser, I might have doubled my yield. But what's done is done, and I'm overall quite happy to have successfully shown one of the few ways to get terpbulamine at home. At this point, I'd like to thank you for watching, and encourage you to subscribe so you don't miss out on the upcoming isocyanide video. It's shaping up to be my most extreme stench documentation yet. And if you want to help support projects like this, feel free to donate or join my Patreon group. The links, as always, are down below. A special thanks goes out to all the dedicated lab coat supporters. Without their donations, this video probably wouldn't exist, so I'm extremely grateful for their patronage. Remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Lab coats out.